Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Fred with the Steel Mace Nation, and today we're speaking with Dylan Edwards, the hybrid movement guy out of the Chicago area. He's a fitness coach, and um, we talk about the Steel Mace and a bunch of other things. He starts off by sharing some boxing history and a little bit of info about his grandfather and how he got into uh, fitness and being a coach. Uh, Dylan is coaching golfers with the Steel Mace, and that was really interesting stuff. Golf is rotational movement at its finest, and how does the Steel Mace help with the golf game? And if you're a fitness coach, what would you like to know about uh, coaching golfers? So perhaps Dylan can give you a little bit of insight to just that. And before we get to it, just want to remind everybody to head on over to steelmacenation.com if you want to buy a snapback hat, if you want to buy a t-shirt. And, uh, of course, there's the 21-Day Steel Mace Challenge and the Steel Mace Workshop, all available for download and purchase. Also, don't forget about the most important sponsors, addexclub.com, Addex Mace and Clubs. When you go to addexclub.com and you make a purchase, use the discount code 360, that's 360, to get your discount and let them know that you're a fan of the show. And also, our other sponsor is macefit.com. Macefit is a comprehensive training program that you could use to as part of your mace training. There's certifications, there's workout programs, uh, there's a lot over there. And if you buy a certification, make sure you reach out to Frank DeMeo and tell him that you're a fan of the show and he'll give you a discount. So What's Swinging Nation? Welcome back to another episode of the Steel Mace Nation podcast. I am your host, Fred Moore, and today with me is Dylan Edwards, who is a uh, fitness and nutrition coach. You're in the uh, Chicago area, and you operate out of 360 Fit, and um, we have been talking for quite a while. Um, yes. you, you got the Steel Mace Nation hat on. You popped up on my radar when, when the hat got purchased and it's like who's this guy because you were like one of the first people to buy the hat and um i've been trying to get you on the podcast for like a year right yeah yeah definitely i mean but things happen you know you're busy i'm busy things happen so yeah absolutely so thank you for coming on dylan i appreciate it that's my pleasure i'm uh, super excited i'm sure we'll have a great discussion fred yeah definitely so let's get to it man because i, I want to hear more about I, you sent me some information some dms it was so interesting uh, your grandfather and, and um, things like that. And I want to hear about that. So um, obviously you use a steel mace and, and um, you know, you, you, people can see that on your Instagram, which is uh, the hybrid movement. Um, the hybrid movement guy. The hybrid the movement guy. A little old to Bill Nye, the science guy. Right. Yeah, I caught that. There we go. So, yeah, man, uh, what's what's the deal? You're you're out there in the uh, Chicago area and you are throwing down fitness left and right. And and yes, <laughs> heavily you you're like always studying. You are a you are a nerd, man. It sounds like you are a nerd. And <laughs> yes, I mean that I mean that in the most respectful way. I appreciate that. No, I am definitely like a uh, a fitness nerd, like a, a weird combination of like a, you know, fitness guy and a and a geek. Yeah. I it's just I, I was lucky to have uh, great teachers and a lot of great mentors. Uh, like standing on the shoulders of giants, um, I believe is what Edison had said once or, or someone like that. And uh, my grandfather, uh, my mother's dad, his name is Robert Beal or Bob Beal. Um, he was a, a big uh, figure for my brothers and, and me. I am uh, the youngest of three brothers. My oldest, my two brothers, Mike and Dave, are about uh, eight, nine years older than me. So um, it, we're... Well, I'm out in the suburbs now, but uh, originally my family is from uh, Old Town, Chicago, and uh, my grandpa was a uh, amateur boxer, 
Uh, he had trained his, his dad and his uncle were his first trainers and uh, his, his biological father, I should say, uh, was also a, a, a pro boxer. He was actually the heavyweight champion of Michigan circa like 1926 or something like that. I think he beat like Tom Sayers or something like that to win the title. I have the, I sent you, so it's all in the, the, those newspaper articles. But uh, yeah, my grandpa, so he was a, a, a very successful amateur boxer. His, his, uh, his dad and his uncle, uh, so his dad's name was uh, Harold Lett, or Ray Vegas was his boxing name. And then his, his uncle, who actually is like, like his father, he has a, the last name Beale, which is a, a, like a whole family story in, in itself. But he was like a boxing guy that uh, was from like the, the Twin Cities, St. Paul area. And they lived in Michigan for a bit. But in the, the St. Paul area, he had, was at uh, 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 Frank Trafton's Rose Room Gym, where like Tommy Gibbons and some old school like really talented boxers used to train and there was a, a guy Billy Miskey that used to train there and actually lived uh in the same building under underneath uh my uh, my great-grandparents and they like were friends and stuff and Billy Miskey has a, a crazy story too that's that's he was like a, a great uh, comeback story he was battling from Bright's disease he fought uh, Bill Brennan to win um a big fight and give his family uh, one last Christmas when he was dying amazing story so uh like there are all these these influences on my grandfather, and then he was in the Chicago area, and then he was uh, lucky to have Tony Zale as one of his trainers, who uh, was a two-time middleweight champion. Uh, they they show his story, uh, the, the the Rocky Graziano side of the story. Him and Rocky Graziano had an awesome boxing trilogy, and in, uh, in the movie somebody up there likes me depicts that. Uh, and then Johnny Kulan, uh, who was like the bantamweight champion or something like that in like the early 1900s uh was also another one of his trainers and then he was in the cyo and he just had he had a lot of great uh trainers and was able to, to climb the ranks from a young age uh unfortunately he broke his hands but he did qualify for the olympics at like 16 years old in the 56 qualifiers and then he broke his hands too much and basically the doctors were like hey dude you want to hold a pencil when you're older or you want to you know keep fighting so he didn't he didn't go pro and then he ended up uh, going to the first martial arts school in the city and like, you know, really kind of helped forward mixed martial arts, long story short, um, in, in the Chicago area. And uh, he had eventually uh, started his own thing called Bushido. It was, I think that it was first the Bushido Karate and then it became the Bushido Fighting Society. So he started teaching at park districts uh, in, in the Chicago area and uh, eventually a uh, uh, one of uh, a, a student that he was a student with, a guy named Fred Degerberg, who was like a, a like a kind of an icon in Chicago, um, a big martial arts influence in himself. He was uh, a student of my grandfather's, and they they then worked together to build up Bushido. They they did a lot of awesome stuff um, in like the '60s and '70s. Um, so then I was I was born in '95. So this is a, a way before me. So then I was lucky to have like those influences later on. You know, like just meeting talking about whatever um so how i got into the steel mace was uh one day i was just talking to, to grandmaster fred and i was talking to him about like just fitness and uh, i think i was talking to him about like power lifting at the time because i think i was power lifting um and they had the uh donny thompson has those those bells I think the fat bells with the like the thing inside of it and he was just talking about how things always repeat itself and he was like you know I was training with the kettlebells because so Grandmaster Degberg was also so he I think placed fourth in a judo competition internationally before there were weight competitions and he's I was like 180 maybe um I mean I think he was the Illinois record holder for a while or champion for um Olympic lifting so he was like familiar with a lots, lots of different types of training and he's been all over the world training with uh, martial artists and stuff. So he was just saying, telling me how like there's nothing new under the sun and like things are, are cylindrical. And I was talking about the trying to say, oh, he's a guy who used kettlebells in the 60s and 70s. So like, well, there's this guy that has a, a thing. He's like, well, let me guess the things inside of it. So he like kind of guessed it. So someone had already tinkered with that idea. 
And then I had mentioned, because I think I seen in an Instagram video or saw in an Instagram video, like the mace from on it or at some point. And like the, this was like early, you know, 2010s. And uh, so he knew all about that. And he was like, oh, uh, one of, you know, one of my students uh, was, you know, wrestling with, uh, and then mentioned like, I think Carl Gotch at the time, because they did the, the wrestling stuff. And then he had mentioned the great Gamma or Gamma the Great and uh, all the, you know, the story of how all the American wrestlers tried to, to best him and they couldn't and he like trained with his mace. So I would like took notes. I still have notes from that conversation actually. And, you know, so then I started Instagramming uh, Steel Mace and I found like Isik and Scott Viala and uh, Steel Mace Flow or, or Leo before Steel Mace Flow existed. And yeah, started trying to swing maces around. I was, like I said, I was powerlifting at the time. So I think I started with like a hammer. I didn't get a mace. And the first mace I got was a quad mace. I went, so I went from a seven pound hammer to a quad mace, which was yeah, a, yeah, a horrible idea, you know, very humbling. So I, I, it's a common, uh, mis I guess we'll say it, it's a mistake, but it's not. It's yeah. just a common thing that people do. They, they go for the heavy one first because they're like 10 pounds. That's, what's that? Yeah, 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 exactly. I, yeah, I do, I do steel mace classes and uh, oh, I had a, we had a new member uh, who saw us at the park over the summer and uh, cause he like lived there and he was training with us and uh, kept going home and like, you know, he'd be all sweaty and like wore out. And uh, his wife was like, man, what are you doing over there? He's like, what are you lifting? He's like, oh, 10 pounds. She's like, what? You know, he's like, oh, just, you gotta, you gotta experience it. And then you'll, you'll understand it's different. And yeah, it's, it's definitely humbling. Yeah. That's really interesting. Your, you know, your story about well, first of all, I mean, y y this history that you have, that you've knowledge of, you, you know all the people's names and everything. Um, so it seems like you're very strongly connected to all that, which is cool. And I feel like you're almost carrying the vibe on a little bit, which, which you know these great people, I mean, these boxing legends that you are mentioning, it was a different time back then. Um, oh yeah. Like, like you, you're, you mentioned, um, I can't remember the guy's name now, but he was, he kept breaking his hands. My grand, that's my grandfather. Yeah. That's your, okay. That's your grandfather. All right. Sorry. I kind of, any, uh, yeah. Any, any <laughs> tore his bicep and didn't know later. And like, if you look at it, it looks like a, you know, and he kept boxing through it. They were like, oh, just keep training. They didn't, even, they didn't even have mouthpieces and like boxing equipment like we think of it, right? So right. And and he probably was breaking his hands because the gloves were much lighter back then. Oh yeah. And they they actually uh it made him in the CYO when he was like, I don't know how old, like 14, 15, 16, they made him wear heavier gloves and he still knocked everyone out in the first <laughs> round. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, they, they like, made him had, wear heavier gloves so he wouldn't knock people out as easily. Yeah, because he was, you know, they, they really wanted to be safe. And he had like a 95% first round knockout percentage in like the CYO, which is the Catholic youth organization that held a lot of the, the boxing tournaments and stuff in, in Chicago around the time. So Mike, Mike Triolo was the, uh, the director, I think, at the time. And it's, it's in the, the newspaper articles. And my grandfather told me about it, you know, so and then I read the, the stories. And so it's, I think it's important to know the names because no one talks about it and then it gets lost. But, yeah, they were like, we got to put heavier gloves on these guys. But still, you know, the wraps and, the, and even the training technique, you know, like spar more, I think, was the idea than not. Not recovery, you know, there's know yeah, the diet was hot dogs and the Babe Ruth era, right? You know, just, right, right, diet, uh, hot dogs and 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 beer and yeah, and soda, yeah, hot dogs and soda. My grandfather right. was a not a, a proponent of drinking, he was a big, you know, but hot dogs definitely, but yeah. you know, soda, yeah, hot dogs was good food back then. I, I'm sure hot dogs were better back then than they are now, whatever they were, <laughs> yeah, just like TV dinners, I'm sure, yeah. So, I mean, but, you know, different times too, different, different mentalities, like tough men that just, oh my God, yeah. man, you, if they were alive nowadays, they'd, I don't know what they would say. I, you know, I guys. used to, I really used to think, I used to argue, I used to be in the argument like, oh, all the, 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 all the technologies improved, you know, and uh, people are bigger, faster, stronger. Of course we would, we would, all the, the, the new stuff would beat the old stuff. But then, you know, when I really think about like everything we just talked about, I'm like, I, you know, that 
that toughness and the durability, you know, yeah. and like the, you know, like John L. Sullivan won in like the 56th round, you know, like that was like a four and a half hour fight. Yeah. Bare knuckles, you know, and then supposedly drinking whiskey and alcohol during it too. So it's like, yeah, that would kill somebody. <laughs> they wouldn't yeah. even make it that far, 56 rounds. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Here. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, you could definitely learn a lot from the past. And, uh, the, and the, I'm a big fan of the show Vikings on history. And uh, King Eckbert has a great quote that I always remember and like talk about. And it's like, we've lost more knowledge than we ever had. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Absolutely. There is a lot of truth to that. That's some really deep thoughts there, too. And um, do, you, do you feel that? that type of thinking is something that y you can use when you train people and, and when you do what you do nowadays? Oh yeah. Cause I, you know, like, I think there's a lot of tools that are still useful. Um, you know, especially with the steel mace, you know, I, I think the steel mace is fantastic. I love it. It speaks to like the warrior spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. And like the martial arts aspect, but I still find a lot of value in like the old school, uh, stuff you know like even like the the machines and and everything so i don't think like just because and even the mace like the mace is technically not new right it's just right. it's like come around again it's rebranded um, yeah it's oh. rebranded and reborn like the version Phoenix, right? version 2.0 <laughs> yes yeah i mean s splitting heads to and shattering shields to now yeah building Spl splitting calories and <laughs> Your quad <laughs> muscles, yeah. Right. <laughs> your shoulders and delta and your grip. Oh, the grip. Yeah. Shredding yeah. the forearms. Yeah. So uh how do you like to actually train with the mace? Like what's your favorite stuff to do in it? Uh, you know, i I like everything. You know, I like the no, you can't of maces. say everything. <laughs> I like to do the traditional stuff, but you know, I do uh I I I do like a lot of different stuff. I try to stay true to my name, uh, the hyper movement guy. So I, me and when uh, Scott and I had a discussion, Scott Viala and I had a discussion. I like just had a, we had a discussion. And I, and I think that this is really like what I want to like get across on, on how I think about um, training as a whole. And it's, you know, there's that, that age old saying, the jack of all trades is a master of none. And I think there is true truth to that. Like focus on the few, not the many. Bruce Lee, you know, I fear not the man who practices 10,000 different kicks, one kick 10,000 times. And I think there's truth to that. But, and I think with a lifetime, like with a, a, the, the white belt uh, mentality of like a, a student of life, you know, if you are at least intelligently trying to piece things together and train different variables or different attributes of your like, quote unquote, fitness avatar, as long as you are consistent and you don't like hurt yourself, and you're, you're, you use different pieces in an intelligent way, if you're getting that, you know, 1% better as, we, you know, the Kaizen principle, 1% every day, and you're doing that in different ways, and you, you kind of use that circular approach, and like you kind of revisit things just so you don't lose it and you sharpen it, you know, um, I think that you can practice different things and not like, you know, lose the, the um, like the truth of the, like, the naturalness of like the one study focus. I think you can still build on uh, one study while like studying something else, because at the end of the day, also like Bruce Lee would say, like you only have two arms and two legs and you know, there are, well, there's a lot of universal patterns to things. Right. And, and it, people, well, well, like professional athletes, they specify what they do. They're sport specific. And, and, you know, I mean, I'm not saying this. I'm, I mean, there's people out there that have degrees and stuff and they've been studying this stuff for a long time. And, and like you, perhaps you could, you could add to this. Uh, when you specify, um, you, you could build up imbalances Absolutely. and really like everyday people um, need more of a general platform so that they could, uh, be well-rounded in their fitness so that they're both durable, resilient, strong, have endurance, a whole combination of everything. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah, I think exactly. I mean, as a, like to be a, as a, like from a, like, you know, an objective, like looking at a, the human specimen perspective, I think, yeah, you want to be kind of well-rounded um, to live like a long and fruitful and vital life, you know, um, and be strong and 
mobile and be able to move well for a long time and into your you know older years so but yeah with like performance in mind and like you know i, I like to say like a unique human performance like that's always in my my slogan um and that is like basically in my mind like to enhance like whatever it is that someone's doing so if you are sitting at a desk for eight to nine hours like we have we're gonna have to discuss you know if, if you want to you know reclaim your posture like we're gonna have to figure out ideas for you to do and and like create a winning plan so that you're spending time doing those things because we only have a limited time together yeah. and with uh like sports performance in mind uh, what my grandpa always would say like repetition repetition that's how you develop skill and i totally agree but like from my perspective like seeing the injuries that he got with his hands breaking and the bicep tears and just other injuries that i've had myself i think repetition is fantastic for skill development but as you said it can develop imbalances. So repetition is also like your worst enemy in that like it, your body will adapt to what you demand of it. And um, like functional adaptation is like what people would, would call these things, right? So like golfers or spent who don't really do things two-sided like in tennis, you're flipping a tennis racket with the mace, you're flipping hands or like golf, you're not normally going to be doing a, a golf swing on both sides. So like you'll develop like a hitch, you know, yeah. your spine might move and that might maybe arguably make your golf swing better because you're already in that position. Maybe right. you could argue that, but then like, maybe that's a sacrifice of, of higher level performance, but from like, and the athlete maybe doesn't even want to think about that. Right. From a training trainer, that's maybe what's happening, but from a trainer's perspective, you know, you probably should be thinking about that and, and try to mitigate some of those consequences that might come with that, like functional adaptation, like per, maybe Tiger Woods's lower back injury, for example, like maybe yeah. there was a functional adaptation that made his swing fantastic. And then the, the downside was maybe that his body just couldn't withstand that for a long period of time, you know? So I'm sure there's a lot of other variables, obviously, but it's just yeah. uh, off top of the head and like, example so and, and do you do you um train uh, quite a few uh golf players so i'm getting into it um uh you know i never thought i would i never thought i would golf but uh, uh my older brother um started like a, a golf a annual golf uh, outing that got bigger and bigger and then you know my friends started golfing more and then it's just uh I realized that golf is a great analogy for life you know and the tight the tight loose tight grip that's like you know Rick talks about or the most people talk about or we talk about I should say um it's like that in golf right you got to be tight loose tight in a way and like and also not in just your swing stuff but like how you how your perspective is because like uh yeah like Ben Hogan wrote about in his book five lessons like we've all probably all seen like just grown men or, or any grown adults throwing clubs into the woods out of frustration because golf is a uh yeah, it's a frustrating sport, but that that's the fun in it, right? Precision is fun to, to pursue because there are a lot of variables um, and it's like the ultimate mental game. Um, and yeah, so I have started to work with more and more uh, golfers. I've been doing a, uh, uh, I started a golf boot camp last year and I'm doing it again and I'm bringing more technology and, you know, more experience now. And I hope to continue to just grow that experience. And uh, I have a, a NASM golf fitness specialist cert certificate that I've been growing and working with and the the statistics are kind of stunning but when you think about what's what's happening it really makes sense like golf's one of the uh, most accessible sports arguably because at any age you could really just get a set of clubs of, of any quality and even just go to a range or, or go anywhere um but um you know there's also the there's aspects of golf or you know if you're a, an amateur golfer and you're going out to play leisurely maybe throwing a few back you know, and maybe not having, you know, a lot of uh, time and experience at the gym. And then you're going out there and we just talked about it's frustrating and, you know, it's hard and it's, there's a lot of precision to it. And if you're trying to swing your driver as hard as you can, you know, uh, there's a statistic, I think it's a, maybe a TPI statistic, but it's basically like if you're swinging, how hard you swing the driver or a club you, in rotational compression, your spine feels that force like four times in Newton's. Right? right. So there's a lot of compressive force on the spine that, you know, and that's just from doing a repetitious golf swing. That's not even considering what happens a lot is just swinging that club real hard and just hitting it straight into the ground. 
with yeah, a lot of yeah. force and then you get frustrated and you just try and do it again right and then yeah. and then yeah so that is like one of the issues that leads to a very high injury statistic in golf and golf's actually arguably maybe the most injury prone sport because there's so many people that play and then you know there's a lot of wrist elbow and back injuries yeah so, i re i remember i played and and when in my 20s um i was learning so you know typical right 20 i could twist my body around like a pretzel and i'm trying to hit the ball with all hell and fury that i could bring yes. and and the ball is just shanking left and right and there was this 70 year old guy we were playing with and he was like an old not I, he might have been older dude he might have been like almost 80 he could hit further than anybody and he had like no backswing he was stiff as hell but his backswing was just just right here and then boom he would just whack it and he would yeah. just keep telling me you're you're trying too hard stop with the backswing you're not you're not tiger woods like chill out and then as soon as i i was like let me swing like this old dude and then all of a sudden like you know i hit it like 175 yards and i was like okay and then i hit it like 200 yards and and it worked it's a great but, technique yeah and then and then from there you develop and you build your backswing up but yeah i think bryson the shambeau like before he started absolutely smashing them you know he did the whole one plane swing where he was not pulling it back that far because he just wanted to get it out there and make contact like in golf you might call it laying it up right where you're not right. trying to because there's there is a that sacrifice of there is more probably air the more you're trying to send it you, there's it's harder to hit the get a good smash factor right and get a good yeah. club face angle and and hit it and, and send it you know not just send it into the woods and you know make a squirrel right. squirrel jump yeah, I, I would hit it in the woods and I'd go look for it. I'd find somebody else's ball and then I'd be like, ah, that's good enough. <laughs> and <then> I'm <laughs> yep. playing with some old crappy ball now. It was my good ball in the woods. Right, um, right. You mentioned tech, using technology. Uh, what, what kind of technology are you using? So I just got a, a, a basic uh, portable launch monitor that is, a, a, from what I've seen, uh, pretty good. Uh, pretty good accuracy so maybe plus or minus like a few percentages for uh, a club head speed ball exit uh speed smash factor which is like how well you're hitting it and then like projected distance um which you know as if it's a cloudy day that it doesn't maybe read as well as some of the the better uh launch monitors but like as far as uh the smash factor the club head speed and the ball exit speed like i think those are uh fantastic numbers to use as baselines and then um, I also have a, a velocity-based uh, training equipment that I just got that I haven't used yet, but uh, basically start measuring like bar speed and um, like how fast uh, you're, you're lifting um, and use more of like the auto-regulation method, uh, especially with golfers and really anybody, it's what I'm going to start uh, messing around with, which basically is uh, you use velocity as a way to auto-regulate like your nervous system and how many reps you're going to do. So with say, we're going to do a, a trap bar deadlift and set a baseline um, or just train, right. Um, we'll do like, all right, we're going to do five sets today, Fred. We're going to just load it up to 25 trap bar deadlift 225. How many reps well, we're going to go until that bar slows down. Hmm. Cause once that bar starts to slow down, then we know we're, we're reaching a fatigue point. And then, you know, we want to train to be fast. So then we might stop after we slow down, like we see that that dip so and we we end that that set get our recovery in and then do the same thing the next time and then you know eight weeks later 16 weeks later whatever when, when we retest if that these these lifts that we test and your bar, bar speed is getting faster then we can assume that you're getting stronger and faster and then hopefully that would correlate with a faster club head speed so then you know we've given you more power hopefully more power with less effort and that power that you can control safely and not get injured. And then, you know, then we got to get our skill work in and make sure that, you know, you're not, you could swing fast, but then also swing with accuracy and precision and, and still kind of put the ball where you want it to be. And when you say uh, velocity and watching the bar speed, you're just, this is just a visual. This is based upon what you're seeing or you're measuring it with a device. So I, uh, Basically, uh, you got to go off visuals like if you're starting or there's other ways to do it with filming and stuff. But no, I, I have a device, uh, Rep1 Strength. I just got it. Uh, it looks really cool. And I think it's like a 3D printed uh, unit. And I believe it's like self-programmed and stuff. And I, I there seems 
to be tested and again be an an affordable device and accessible to people and to trainers um that you know it's not your typical it's not like as expensive as some of the other units that are probably awesome and you know give maybe arguably some more precise data and have more features but um to just like quote unquote get, get the feet wet um yeah I, I have a device that it's like it'll be like this big and uh, hasn't shipped yet i don't i don't have it yet but then it has like a tether with a magnet or that you can loop around so that you could measure uh all the traditional lifts all the olympic lifts and probably make up some other stuff um and just you know try and uh figure out like rotational power i'm sure there's a lot of to ways that you can you know macgyver it yeah that's that's incredible now interestingly enough you know just thinking about the old days which are fast behind us because technology is just wickedly coming out like boom new stuff all the time but these old school coaches the good ones yeah they, they could they could do exactly what you're talking about just by watching yeah but, i agree i agree but they they had to learn it over sometimes decades right they they just had to have uh, uh trial after trial you know they're, they're they're catching on they're learning they're developing it this piece of uh, this device that you're talking about will it will speed that up. Like someone such as yourself, you're still a young guy. Um, you're going to be doing this for a long time. You're just going to be able to visual. Uh, you're going to be able to eyeball it on your own because this device is going to give you something, a, a little feedback. And you're going to go, okay, see, look, this is where it slowed down. I thought I noticed that. Now you're going to be more sure of what you see. And then as new technology comes out, that just builds on what you're developing at a faster rate. It's just accelerated. Absolutely. And then from a, that's what's so exciting. Like from a training perspective, the more that uh, we can understand that and the more that uh, this technology becomes accessible and a, a key point is, you know, intuition and like how you're feeling and all that stuff is, is always going to be extremely important. Right. You can use the technology to like link with that. But the more accessible this technology becomes to us, it also is like that for our clients too. So um, I think it'll be more empowering and like allow us to, to really like help people make a lot of progress because uh, yeah, if, like just for, for golf, for example. So like a lot of, for using this launch monitor, like what a lot of the pros will do and a lot of the, uh, the pro trainers is if, if you can use this club head speed and, and the really good ones will basically give you a really accurate distance, like of how far, like they, and with the Sims and stuff, like it, it has a really good, like kind of representation. So then, you know, like you talked about that drill with that old man, you know, pulling back, like Bryson DeChambeau is very, like some players are, but some players aren't, but it's interesting to see the players that are like DeChambeau. He's like trying to figure out, oh, if I pull it back this far with my seven iron and, you know, this will go about this far. Now, if I pull it back three inches further with the same tempo of a swing, it'll go this far. So he's trying to like figure that out because when you're on the golf course, when you're playing, you're not, it's not like you're going to, hold on, let me pull out this launch monitor real quick, <laughs> right. you know? So, but when you're training and like doing like, you know, just getting out there and like, you know, practicing, practicing playing, or you're at the range, it, t it allows you to make your training uh, that much more like specific like um, one thing that I had to learn and struggled with and uh, um, is like when you're learning to play golf like uh, with all the frustration you know that there is involved with it um, like you're starting out and you know especially like guys like us you know we're at the gym or we're crushing weights we're working out you know and then, you know, we feel like we're probably good at that. And then we go to the golf range and, you know, we get just like the mace initially, you know, it's like a massively humbling experience. Well, when you start practicing, like when I started practicing, I would just go and like put $20 on my card at the range and, you know, it'd be like 20 minutes go by and I just smashed 400 drives and 300 of them went in, you know, into the parking lot to the <laughs> right, you know, yeah. you know where, where I wanted it to go. And uh, I really didn't get better because I didn't have a plan and I wasn't working on anything and I didn't have right. like a variable to work on you know now with the, this technology at least you can say all right well don't pull it back so far let's let's develop a controllable decent club head speed with a good smash factor and a good like angle of approach and get that well and then then keep building and building and building like uh what uh you know Mr. Mace Man Rick Brown would say in the uh, jungle of strength and conditioning don't sneak up on heavyweights or heavyweights will sneak up on you it's like don't try and smash the drive 
by, you know, all and twists, twists like a pretzel if you don't have the, the control to do that. But by all means, if you can get back there and twist the shoulders and smash that thing yeah. straight and send it, then. Yeah, then you have a, a talent. So, yeah, exactly. but not most people. Not yeah. Most. No. <laughs> no. So now with your clients, are you using the steel mace um, effectively to help them with their golf game and fix imbalances and stuff? Yeah, yeah. We're working on, you know, we use the mace. We use a lot of tools, the Bulgarian bags and I'll, I'll, the tots and a lot of the, the cool stuff coming out uh, from Mike Rokol and uh, uh, Rock Solid Functional Training. Um, but What yeah, kind the, of stuff are you using from him? Uh, the tots, you know, the knowledge with the bags. The oh, Bulgarian okay, bags, yes. I find. Those are really cool. But yeah, the mace specifically. Um, yeah, I've been, so I've been using the mace since like 2013. Mm -hmm. That's when I like did, did the hammer stuff and then like, you know, just didn't really know anything and just tried to like integrate it. And then I, I started learning more, more material and then about 2015, I became, I started working at a sports performance center, doing some training out of there and helping like with operations and uh, working like with a, a supplement brand and brought the mace and clubs and some on it stuff to work with athletes like for uh, like pitching, um, like doing like the bow and arrow and even grabbing like the, the mace head and like using it like maybe even like like grips, right? For a pitcher and like trying to work on these tissue qualities, you know, cause we talked about like repetition, throwing, 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 throwing. Well, yeah. let's, let's get some isometric lengthening, you know, rotate back, get into some specific positions, but with specific goals. Um, and just like a lot of the, the other benefits of like, you know, just some of the basic club and, and mace stuff like the, the pendulums and you know, open up the shoulders and, you know, every, everything I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of was able to work with, with athletes in that perspective. Um, and then I was, uh, after some, you know, bouncing around and some uh, transitional stuff in life and with uh, uh, work, then I ended up uh, working um, at various places. I worked for a, a, at a chiropractic clinic for a little while and then I had also started interning and working with a, a board certified neurologist a, a certified social worker who does neurofeedback and uh, try to use the mace uh, with a, a lot of different what things you know and um, for a lot of different things you know for like deep neurology yeah uh, and uh, yeah so and then also obviously sports performance and general strength and conditioning so I tried I I have had the pleasure of working with a lot of different people from a lot of different demographics, sports performance and injury rehab alike. And whether it's a, a primal flow light wooden mace, you know, um, for injury rehab or just to learn the basics and like figure out how this centrifugal training thing works, um, you know, and then to the heavy quad maces and to the, the loadable maces. I don't have an Adex mace yet that's on the list, but I have uh, the loadable oh. From, you gotta uh, get one. I know, I know. That's high on the list. Um, I've made my own like oversized basketball concrete filled mace and like a three quarters inch steel pipe that is like really got to be warmed up for that one. But it's just uh, out of curiosity, which addicts are you eyeballing? Which one do you want to get first? Because he's got the regular one. He's got the uh, the freestyle, which is like a, a fatter handle. Sounds and like you would know better than me, Fred. How you you got to tell me. I don't like <laughs> It's a preference thing, really. I mean, yeah. I, I the, did you ever look at the arc? I've seen, yeah, I've seen like some of the different uh, models, and I've seen a lot Yo, of people the arc using is them. Sick, it is sick, but it's not. You know, it's shorter. It's shorter. It's like it's a hybrid. Oh, it's, there it's we go. Between club and mace, and That's awesome. Yeah, but like I, I load like 30, 35 pounds on that, and I just like blah, 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 just crush out 10 and twos on it and it's like i get all pumped up i don't it's like i'm lifting dumbbells or something like i'm I, my muscles get pumped i start like veins popping out that's like the only mace i could do that with so that that's what i i would recommend but you know it depends um the freestyle's got the fatter handle so it's a little you know um, I guess more comfortable, but there's nothing better than the skinny handle, regular old Adex. Um, it, it just, it, if, especially if you do like long haul, like runs, like five minutes of 10 and twos or swings, it just, your hands, it's such a challenge on your hands because that thing is just all like, it's just doing this inside your hands, you know? Yeah. And it, you gotta just keep squeezing. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, I mean, your hands are like, if you go for five minutes, your hands look like 
giant bear paws when they're yeah, you're gonna have like four four sets of calluses i'm sure yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know it's it's one of those preference things yeah you should uh just uh talk to don over there and see i don't know he might have some key questions to ask you that you could use i will have to i'm sure honestly within like five ten year span i'll have all of them but you know. yeah yeah what, which one to start with? That's the question. Yeah, that's all. And it, yeah, it's like it's like when you were playing with GI Joes. It's like it, just pick one, <laughs> and then one day your your parents are gonna be like, "God damn it, your GI Joes are all over the floor." Yeah, and you have, an, you have a Apache helicopter flying on a string over you know from the <laughs> fan blade. What's going on? You, know, you probably did do that. What you? Oh, I did. I had parachuters and stuff. Yeah, I was. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were like you were the kid who was very you played, but you were technical. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, well, we're gonna tie up some fishing line for this. Well, that's gonna take like two hours just to do that, and then I gotta go home and eat grilled cheese sandwich. So can we just play? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. That's pretty accurate. You know me well already. Look at that. Well, you know, it's it's you. You have you definitely are um, a tech guy, technology guy, and everything. You're talking about it with your with your training and your fitness and everything, and um, you know with uh, when it comes to your what well, like what well, you opened up the podcast talking about fight you know the, your grandfather being a fighter and everything are you also training fighters uh i have worked with like people at a box and done mma stuff okay um specifically i mean not really quite as much but at the gym at 360 you know we have wrestling mats we do kickboxing like cardio kickboxing classes oh um, really and we don't do some like open rolling and stuff like that obviously not as much with uh within the last year but yeah, yeah. um but do you have jujitsu coaches there oh we don't uh christian uh has done like jujitsu uh he used to work at a, an mma gym um i don't have i'm I don't have a, I'm a white belt in jujitsu, but I, I do like, I've attended seminars and do open rolling and stuff. So, okay. um, but yeah, I, I have a, a, I'm belted. I have a black belt under my grandfather in Bushido karate. So that's like a stand up style. And we practice like wrestling takedowns and stuff too, but you know, your I'm, grandfather I'm, taught you that. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, this was your grandfather. He didn't just like give you the belt, right? No. So, uh, I, it wasn't traditional. Like he did have a traditional school, right? Where you'd like climb the ranks, have the gi. Um, I didn't wear a gi, like, cause I would come up. I was like, a, I basically was like, when I was like 13, like getting into high school, I had like self esteem issues, even though I had like, you know, older brothers. And maybe I, I just felt like I was like a scrawny kid and I played, I had like in a video game addiction and I had like warts on my hands and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which might might seem, you know, I maybe I was I didn't you know, I want to keep playing with those GI Joes and stuff, but I had like a problem leaving my comfort zone uh, yeah. as a kid, I guess. Probably from just like fear, right? Uh, so, um, I I had asked him like one time, um, you know, like I want you to to teach me, and like he never really pushed it on us, and he actually never wanted my brothers I to to fight because he was very aware of like people getting punch drunk, as he would call it, you know, and all, before they really knew about CTE and all the right. weird stuff, he he didn't. He didn't like uh, what he saw. So he tried to like told, he basically like, look, you can play football and basketball, but you, if you guys want to fight, like I won't teach you for self-defense and just to like, you know, for, for good training, I'll teach you. But there's a caveat, like I am, you know, that's the problem. I mean, I'm your grandfather. Other people might be like, you know, I would just did, here you go. So he was not, you know, of that, uh, when he was, so he's a member of the Illinois Martial Arts uh, and Boxing Hall of Fames. And uh, one of his quotes when he was inducted was, you know, um, he thinks that black belts today are kind of given out like Cracker Jacks. And uh, there's not like the same aspect that it may have been. You know, of course, that's a, a, obviously a ge generalized statement. Yeah. There's a lot of great black belts still out there in a lot of great schools. But right. I understand. We understand that. Right. So, uh, yeah, he. Uh, took me like six years of really like showing up and you know wanting to train and I had to like always get him like he had plans but I had to be like all right we're gonna train today and if I like had track practice and got home and I was tired and he saw I wasn't I was just going through the motions he would literally be like all right we're done I'm, I'm not doing it today I'm gonna go watch tv you know go watch something and he wouldn't like put the effort into it he'd go he's also an avid woodworker um especially then as he's now in uh, 83 uh he isn't done but like this all these wood things behind me is handcrafted tongue and groove you know precision 
Uh, so it's worth what, like, that. you mean like that, that dresser right behind yeah. your left yeah, shoulder? Yeah, amongst, and I have a, I, you, I have this all set up. I could send you a picture after. It's really beautiful. You know, I have a roll top desk. He actually almost cut his finger off making this roll top desk. Thankfully, it's still there. It's a little mangled, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's, it's part of the sacrifice that's that so comes cool, with chasing man. it. And then I have like dressers. He like the whole house. He got like, uh, he lost his hearing. Uh, he had a, um, in like the early 90s. So he's never heard my voice. That's another thing too that i feel like that's really helped me as a trainer and as a person uh having to communicate with him he doesn't do sign language he was too proud for that um in his work in his like way right and uh just reads lips to a degree but like there's still lags so you have to write things down i have an app on my phone so there was always like you know uh communication thing but there was also like this purity to his coaching because like he had what he had and that's what he had like you know focused on and like it was uh so so you aspect of that you're you're saying by learning to communicate with him that's helped you with being a a communicator and a coach to oh yeah, yeah i mean it to me it's like you know i have this van dam poster behind me over here i'm pointing over there you know uh and it's like the you know and like especially with martial arts you know a lot of martial artists love the the blood sport you know movie and it's like that that uh that hidden teacher, right. The, that he has the Shidoshi, you know, and he's just like, Oh, and he gets like all that knowledge out of him. Um, it's just like, I feel like, you know, my uh, brother's not an advantage, um, like a- athletic wise and just like life wise, because we, he had all of this life experience, um, you know, and, you know, I was like a hall of fame athlete and like a Olympic qualifier, but then lost his hearing and you know had like this this handicap that was very humbling you know in its own right and then um yeah there's like a learning aspect to it like a sixth sense of like and like how he describes things is in very different than i i like someone else would or probably how he would if he didn't have that because it's just obviously changes how you think and how how he would describe um like movements like, and techniques or just stories. Like he's an amazing storyteller. Um, okay. And, and because the way he couldn't hear, you're saying he would describe things differently because he didn't have that sense. It just changed the way he emoted or the way he. Yeah, exactly. Like he would describe things. And I can imagine. Cause like, if you're hard of hearing and like, he can't hear anything. So it's yeah. like, you don't, he has no in like stimulus of the environment, kind of what's happening and stuff. So I feel like that, in turn made him very good at being able to create the experience and build the environment verbally. Wow. And, and what's the, the biggest things that you took out of that, that you could bring to your coaching? So, I mean, uh, silence is, you know, can explain a lot, you know, and, uh, it's some it's, silence is not a bad thing, you know, and it's good to, to really dive into the basics. Like he's known for like diving into the basics, like one thing, at a time, but we would have inevitably get to many different things, but like, it just takes more time. Right. Yeah. So dedication, you know, and, and kind of sacrifice of your time. And, and if you're going to do something, then you, you, you want to dive into it with a lot of focus and a lot of effort, or just, you know, maybe it's a sign that you shouldn't be doing that that day and your focus is elsewhere. And he was always big on that too. Like, you know, if you're not focused, like you're going to develop bad habits and let's not even, let's not even do it. Let's just, take the day off, go do something else, get your mind right, you know. Wow, yeah. that, And you know what? That's – maybe we're seeing less and less of that nowadays. I mean, we're not always going to walk in to our training or our uh, schooling or anything like that, like being perfect every time. Um, and and if, you're, if your mind is off and you're not focused and you're thinking about 10 th- other things except for what's in front of you, and then you – try to just hack through it you're actually getting like diminishing quality of returns yeah because you're like ingraining bad habits and stuff you know and you're it's yeah you're not you're not putting in the precision i've been really diving into the golf stuff lately and there was a a trainer i don't know who it was it might have been ben shear it was like a a really good uh uh, pga like strength and conditioning trainer or, or maybe it was him or someone else um but they were talking about like one of the biggest issues they see in coaching uh, juniors and like young golfers is they'll go to the store. Parents will go to the store or like the, they'll just go and buy some generic club for juniors that are totally not like the right length. They're not specific. They don't have the same precision. They're not precise for the athlete. 
and it like leads to movement faults in the golf swing that could, you know, stay with you. It's the base you're building. So you reap what you sow. So, um, you know, I'm not saying that you're not going to come back from that and be a good golfer. Right. But I'm sure that just the more precision, you know, you start off with that, you know, or, or as a coach put into things, you know, and thinking of the little things like that, because it's not, it's not the, the, the other person's job, right. It's the, the movement professional's job. So that right. amount of precision and thought kind of, yeah, that's, that's why there's fitness professionals and coaches and stuff. Cause that's some deep level thinking, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. And, and, you know, like when you're going to get your kids into a sport, like you just pointed out, it's a, it's a big thing. It's like, well, when, when am I going to buy, you know, a $600 club from, for my kid, they're going to grow out of it and they might not even like, like the game. So obviously you're not going to go to that level, but if yeah. you just go completely cheapo crappy. Yeah. Cheap means cheap sometimes, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like now the kid's really not going to, go anywhere they're gonna get so frustrated and you know it's it, it's like anything like you're gonna get your your kids gonna start playing piano well, i mean you at least want a piano that's gonna stay in tune it's gonna all the keys are gonna feel right and everything so you might have to pay a little bit more you don't have to go nuts but this is this is what you have to do yeah yeah i mean it's the right something. tool for the job exactly yeah i mean you know and i'm sure with the right thinking too like yeah if you buy some custom golf clubs and then they grow the next year i'm sure you know if you're smart enough you could wheel and deal those previous golf clubs or yeah. or change the shaft length and stuff because you know there's you could you could like customize it's like the, i guess like the ad in itself right if you know someone that knows their golf clubs i'm sure they could uh, figure some stuff out now that might change like the the club how it's the the actual irons and stuff if you change the shaft too much and stuff so i mean but i'm sure you could use the same things for a little time so that's just again like I would have never have thought about this stuff like a year ago, but now I've just been lucky to have the internet and be able to listen to really smart people, you know, that have already done years and years of work and coaching to figure these things out. And then I'm just blessed to be able to kind of add that into the toolkit and try and, you know, apply it and, and use the technology to take some of the guesswork out, but then hopefully apply some of that good old fashioned old school coaching, you know, and like connecting and communicating, right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, good point. And I'll ask you this question um, as far as like, we know old school coaching and, and, and all that is always needed. And, and that's a, it's something we need to look at our predecessors and pull forward and use what, what they use, but with technology coming out at such a rapid rate, um, do you think, do you think one of the, the problems with technology is, is that people don't know what to buy, what to do with it. And then it gets yeah. all cluster fucked and every 100%. You, you, yeah. So a, a coach, probably a, a modern day coach and a coach of the future, the cyborg future coach, <laughs> they need to, they need to bring the old school with them, but they also need to help their clients with using the technology. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I actually, that's my logo. That's what I kind of, you, so I have a 3d printed version right here. And my, I have a buddy using the 3d printing. So I was oh, able yeah. to 3d print this. So I have like the actual logos like red and stuff, but so I have the, the Thor hammer, which is like, you got to be worthy. Right. And the mace, which is like also awesome and pretty much got to be worthy to want to wield it. Right. And on the, then I had the, the left side brain, like the logic brain, which you, maybe can't see it too well but it's like all like you know like electrodes and it's like the computer side like representation of technology and then the other side is the the creative like human side of the brain if you will you know that like has imagination and explores so that's kind of what i'm trying to like blend those two things you know seamlessly but yeah man technology is as good as it is too there's definitely uh we're definitely in that weird like you know awkward teenager like <laughs> Yeah. Like we're talking like centers in basketball, you know, that like are just so big and could be so good, but they just are like raw athletic wise. Like that's where we're at. I think with a lot of technology, like we haven't quite gotten over a lot of hurdles and figured things out. And then there's like, uh, yeah, I, I've gotten, I've tried thing. I have a lot of great technological tools and there's a lot of things that I've tried that I maybe just don't work for me, but um, that I, you know, I wouldn't, particularly use again um but you yeah. wouldn't know that until you try it and use yeah. it and see the interface and uh, the biggest thing that i think that i see is the like uh the 
the fact that um, even though a lot of these uh, softwares and stuff have your information and it's like your numbers and stuff, it's sometimes they don't, especially when it's like Apple and Android, like they just don't communicate all that well together because they just don't want to share or have right. that third party integration. So that's, that's the most frustrating hurdle, especially with like, you know, getting like the digital interface for clients and stuff out. Like that's frustrating from a, a content creator uh, um, stance, I guess, but yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and I think like, you know, I mean, I use technology, you know, and I, I like to work out. So I, I've gone through little periods here and there where oh, I'll get this, you know, heart rate monitor and th that's all yeah. fine and good because it's, it's nice to be able to monitor your heart rate, yes. but uh, people sometimes they'll get into technology along with their sport or whatever it is they're doing. And they get so OCD over it. And I've, I've been think, there too. I've been there too. Yeah. And, and you, you, all of a sudden it's like, you, you're, you're not really, having a good time anymore because you're so concerned I, used to, about I, I bought an hrv device now i'm happy my apple watch gives me a better representation of hrv which it really didn't before so i bought like a specific hrv device which i won't name um but i and it worked really well at first but then at like after like a few months it was like some firmware issues or whatever and i didn't yeah. really like i it just basically I would try to test my HRV in the morning, which is trying to tell me if I'm recovered and I'm ready to train. And it worked so great the first time. And like, I really felt like, man, the numbers it's giving me, it's like really representative of like a good representation of like how I really feel and how my nervous system's probably at. Like if it tells me to train, like I feel ready to train. And when I notice that I'll, I wake up and I'm like, oh, you know, those deadlifts, massive amount of 360s, you know, they took me out. I should recover and you look you test it and it's like you should recover then it's like c confirms your intuition yeah uh, that's how it started out but then this particular device like it started it wouldn't connect to my phone and i would like get really frustrated i'd be like trying to do like plug it in five times and like reset it and stuff yeah. and then i started to realize and i like take that you know take a step back and like what the hell am i doing you know i'm supposed to be for my recovery now i'm like waking up in the morning starting off my day with like anxiety because i can't see my my number so you know there's there's we there's a lot of technology and there's a lot of devices that have weeded that out and i'm sure that even upgraded and stuff too but that's a good example of of how it can get and that's why it's good that's why i always tell people like look it's just a number it's not like mm -hmm. it's not the death sentence it's not like it's the same thing with like a lot of imaging and stuff too i don't think that an, an x-ray is a telltale like it's not like a death sentence for some people yeah um, yeah, yeah not to say that it's not it's not good it's not useful but like it has a a, a purpose and it's a good thing to look at it objectively and not kind of get so emotional about some of these, these numbers and stats. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and that, and I think, you know, it, when you get caught up in that, it just diminishes from why you're doing it, your enjoyment, you know, what got you into it to begin with was, exactly. you know, like there, you liked it, you know, you like mountain biking, you like powerlifting, whatever it is. So don't forget that, you know, and then going back to, if you do have a trainer or a coach, let them be the ones to mess around with the technology because they're going to be using that on all their clients all day long. Yes. And then they'll know what's good to use, what's not to use and how to use it and how to read it and how to like explain it to you. So you don't get hung up on the numbers because once you start getting that going in your head, that could change whether or not you PR or, uh, you know, complete a race or whatever. Yeah, you start to get the paralysis by analysis, right? Yeah, that's so, it, yeah. Yeah, and that's where, I get, like, some athletes, I think, like to know the, the, the data because they're just, like, nerds like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a lot of athletes that I – that or people that don't want to hear it and, like, they just don't care. It's not, like, yeah. just, it's not what they're about. And they'd rather spend their time talking about something else. And that's totally cool, too. And that's why, again I, – I, not again, but that's why it's important as a – um as a professional and, you know, for fitness or healthcare, I think to be adaptable, you know, with people and be able to respond accordingly. And, you know, if someone, if you can tell that people are into the data and they get better from it, probably maybe that's something you want to share and maybe set some goals for that data. But on the flip side, there's definitely people like I, I've, uh, with nutrition coaching, like with, uh, like using uh, Fitbit or my, or my fitness pal, or like doing meal prep, like there's people that want, like, listen, just, feed me tell me what to eat give me a <laughs> yeah. meal prep company 
I'll buy everything and mm-hmm. like just spell it out for me. There's other people that are like, well, I want more variability. And, right. and there's other people that are like, look, I can't track. It just freaks me out. It gives me, uh, it's too much time. I don't want to yeah. get my phone like that. And it's like, okay, well, there's other strategies, you know, we can figure out. So I, that's, I think it's important to be adaptable and not force the t- technology because some people really may not, that doesn't, appeal to them and they may yeah. not even want to measure now it's not to say you shouldn't use it like maybe you should or shouldn't maybe it's for your knowledge but you know i think that's where you got to kind of assess and like add that specificity to the person like will using this velocity-based training device for them really make a difference like i think for a lot of general population people i think yeah it's good data to still have because you can figure out are they dealing are they able to still produce force deal with force well and that can help with injury resolve or stuff but for for like group training like maybe you're doing some sort of group training and it's like very time consuming to use a certain technology and you know you just really want to use this technology because you, you just bought it and you just like watch all these youtube trailers on it and stuff you're like oh i gotta do it and then it takes like 35 minutes to set up and get going and like transition. And then like, it's only a 45 to minute to an hour class. And then like, it's done. And then like the people didn't really get the benefit from it because it took too long. So yeah. I think knowing how you're going to use it and knowing the, how, that you're going to use it efficiently and it's going to not diminish value in other ways, I think is extremely important and kind of what I've had to learn the hard way and, uh, and uh, try to, you know, still learn and, and figure out especially as you know we refine what we're good at and get better with new things and then try and integrate inevitably new stuff that's going to come out nice man nice and and uh before we go can you just uh give us a rundown of your you have a couple of fitness degrees i know you mentioned your nasm golf certification but you are a certified personal trainer and a strength coach and a nutrition coach right yeah, so I've, um, I'm a NASM golf fitness specialist. My, I'm an ACE certified personal trainer, ACE orthopedic specialist. Uh, I have uh, my nutrition uh, certifi- certifications, uh, precision nutrition, which I'm a level one in that. Uh, I have the uh, living.fit uh, kettlebells, level one and two, and the, the battle ropes. Um, Rick Brown certified. Uh, I've trained with him both in person, and then I, I've always, I kind of, review his online thing as well um which is filled with great stuff and you know great analogies and little tidbits and scooby snacks i like to always go back to uh primal flow mace movement um i was the first one for that which i was i'm honored to to do that that was an awesome online experience i learned a lot online steel mace flow level one which was a lot of great awesome online content that i was able to pick a lot from as well too uh i'm certified uh I have, um, I have next to me, so I'm looking up a uh, certificate of uh, completion for the certified functional strength coach uh, level one, which is out, that's Mike Boyle, which is out, out by you. Um, and I've been to uh, DNS courses for exercise science, which is uh, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, which is like a, a lot of breathing uh, stuff. And um, oh, interesting. Yeah. And then I've uh, just actually um, got accepted to uh, graduate school um so i'll be going to university of illinois chicago congratulations our uh, 2024 doctor of physical therapy class wow so uh yeah so i'm training at a 360 fit uh, in arlington heights right now with uh, christian koshaba and a lot of other great trainers um he's a guy you should definitely get on, on this podcast he's a veteran uh does a lot of cool stuff has used the mace for a long time um and uh, yeah, so I'll, I got like six months. So I start that grad school. So trying to just, you know, add value to all, all these clients and see if I could still train to a, a good capacity. But, you know, going to grad school will take a, a good chunk of my time. So I'm excited to kind of transition to this next step and be able to come out and add even more value. And I'm a big fan of a lot of people in the MACE community, like Dr. Lamana, and I've spoken with him and I like all the physics and stuff. And he even helped me with my, I was literally in physics and anatomy while he was starting to post all these physics things in anatomy. I literally brought my uh, maces in the physics class over at Harper College, did some stuff with the mace. So oh, wow. uh, draw inspiration from a lot of uh, you guys and gals out there. And uh, it's real cool. And um uh, yeah, man. And so, how um, can people get in contact with you? Uh, they can find me on Instagram uh, at uh, the hybrid movement guy with an underscore in between each. Um, they can follow 360 fit 
um, which is the gym out of Arlington Heights. It's a really cool gym. We're climbing wall. We got uh, a lot of cool equipment. Um, Christian is a, a great trainer and a lot of great, awesome trainers out of there. Um, and yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. You can, you can find me. All right. All right. And uh, you have anything coming out down the pike uh, special b besides your going to for your uh, doctorate in six months? Like, yeah. yeah, we're going. Uh, Christian and I are heading down to or heading up to Eau Claire uh, to uh, actually do our level two Bulgarian bag certification with uh, <laughs> Mr. Mike and Robbie Ricol. Um, yeah. And uh, that, that's going to be a blast. Uh, those guys are awesome. Uh, so that'll be great. Um, and then I might be uh, heading down to Tennessee, uh, where Christian actually uh, uh, lives. Uh, so we might be able to do some stuff at some uh, CrossFit gyms out there uh, with the mace and the, the Bulgarian bags and such. And uh, I'm also studying for my uh, TSAC uh, F uh, cert certification, the Tactical Strength and Conditioning Facilitator. So I got that book. Uh, and that's been fun. I've been doing the uh, Kempo Orange Belt class with uh, Dr. Joey. Wow. Uh, yeah, I just like, you know, a little bit like that 1%, right? If you just yeah. go a little bit at a day, eventually you're done and you've learned a lot. And if you take good notes, you just keep going back. Yeah, that's uh, terrific, man. You're always... Well, one thing I think I, I didn't mention, and I want to mention, uh, because I appreciate you as a firefighter, and I think that's, you know, really respectable and really cool. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of you for that, and uh, that's that's really why I, I really started appreciating the podcast and stuff, because my great-grandpa, uh, Ray, was a, after, so he was a, a pro boxer. He uh, then went to World War II. I actually keep... Uh, I have his knife that I keep on my desk. So this is his actual knife that he sent back home from the war. That's a K-bar knife, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, wow, he man. sent that back home. So I keep it on my desk. Um, That's old. And then he, uh, after the, he came back, uh, he became an MP. He was an MP in the army there. And then he came back and became a firefighter in Chicago on a fireboat. Unfortunately, lost his eye. In an accident, so he had a glass eye. But uh, yeah, wow. he was the champion of Michigan, circa 19, late 1920s, and fought Jack Dempsey in 1932 to a, a draw in an exhibition because Jack Dempsey uh, needed some money and he went on like a bunch of smoker fight tours after he was champion. So he was older um, and was fighting. He fought like 60 times in like two months to make some ends meet. But uh, my great grandpa is one of those guys, and I were really big Jack Dempsey fans. And, yeah. Uh, so I, I think that's a really cool part of the story. And, uh, yeah, I'm honored to, to kind of have that lineage and I like talking about it and sharing it and I'm, you know, firefighter. So yeah. firefighter. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a really cool thing. Uh, that history that you have there. I'm, I'm, and I'm glad you're appreciating it. It's, you know, um, it's it's fascinating it really is i love history so i could i could listen to people like you talk all day about stuff like that especially yeah, well, when you're dropping big names like that well each of those names man we could really dive into so yeah. you know i'm sure someday hopefully in the in the future you know we uh, meet up in person maybe you know have throw a few back and talk about you know your life and some of these cool names and other i'm sure we would talk about a lot of cool stuff yeah that's definitely like i, I was telling my wife that i was like you know i, I had even before covid i was like you know dude I, I talk to the coolest people man and i'm doing this podcast and and really at the end of the day i'm just glad i don't care i don't even care if anybody watches it i'm just having an awesome conversation with somebody without any interruptions and anything like that and it's like i feel like after i get off the zoom call with these people I could call them up and be like, Hey, I'm going to fly out and hang out with you. And, and they'd be like, yeah, no problem. And, and in some cases 100%. I've kind of done that a little bit, but I was starting to think, let's do, let's start doing that. And then COVID hit. Yeah. It was unfortunate, but I, I think that's great. I have a list. I have a litany of people I would, that I met on social media that I would love to see like Dr. Joey, you, yeah. uh, Randall, um, from Red Forest, Chinese boxing, Scott Viala. I'd love to go to Canada and make like a Canada trip and, yeah. Yeah, so hopefully the you know things uh, it get will. better, and yeah, I'm I'm confident, and faithful in that, and then I'm sure that uh, that'll transpire, and you know we'll have these fun retreats because yeah, I mean, hey, hey, I, we're all fitness we people. To, the more we get together, you know, it was one thing that Rick said. I remember he said it, and it really uh, really struck me and stuck with me. And he was like, "We're losing the war of like for for healthcare, you know, of like fitness and stuff. Like the numbers are not on our side." 
Um, oh, yeah. And like, you know, when you really take a step back and look at that and, you know, and like, especially in the fitness industry, there, there's a lot of like, you know, there's only like few uh, clients that people are really trying to all train. So I think the more that we can get together and figure out ways and solutions to get more people in, into fitness and more people moving. And, you know, um, I think that would just help the economy and help the world and help everything, you know, help the universe. I think everything would be better if people just yeah. swing bases and work out and, you know, just get fit. It's, it's, it's crazy. And, and we've heard it a million times now, especially since COVID hit and people have made this um, observation and, and they would make a post or whatever. And it's like, here we are where there's this healthcare crisis, this, this virus. And, and you don't see a public message. You don't see like the government or anybody or a any of the, um, the CDC, the WHO, or anybody, right? They, you never hear them say anything about uh, exercise, getting enough vitamin D, which there's tons of studies that show if you take vitamin D, yeah. air, not just- It's like vitamin D with K2. You have like the uh, yeah. very, very low mortality percentage. Of right, and, and that nobody talks about that. So I'm over here popping vitamin D and I'm like getting, going out in the sun, I'm getting exercise. Yes. And, um, and it's like, yeah, okay, vaccine, vaccine, but there's things we could do. And, and this is what needs to be turned around. Like, this is like a whole other podcast we could do here. Yeah. Um, but this is what needs to be turned around. And, and I came up with another thought. I was talking to somebody. I was like, they should be like people like you really like people like, like i say you because you have degrees like you've gone to school you're gonna be it sounds like you're gonna be going to school forever you you're like addicted to it I don't know hopefully what's, yeah I don't know something's maybe. wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> Definitely but, but wrong. you have invested your own time effort energy and money into becoming smarter and better at teaching people how to be healthy the government the who somebody should be taking people like you and like building you up like here dude here's here's like a hundred grand open up a business and we're gonna we're gonna fund you we want people to get healthier and then we watch healthcare costs start going down because yeah. there's a campaign but like see everybody says the campaign is really to keep us ill keep us yeah, sick like I've been, I've been doing insulin. as long as I've been doing the mace. Another again, another po I've, I've so I wrote my ebook on breathing. I've uh, I've done uh, things for the Illinois Human Department of Human Health Services and the Illinois Human Performance Project for breathing. Um, and I talk about Wim Hof breathing all the time. And like, why I I've, I feel like that should be something that more like I know a lot of people know about him, especially now. But I still feel like. Why don't more people know about him? The guy yeah. has shown that you can, he can, he injected himself with uh, E. coli, I believe even malaria and fought it off. And not only did he do it, but he had like other untrained subjects basically do it in a lab setting. And I know the Huberman labs has, has done a ton of research and he's like one of the top brain neuro guys on the planet. And he's saying how, how great it is. And I think Kelly Strett said, what Wim Hof is doing is more important than all the Apollo missions combined. And you have these like, you know, very popular PhD scientists, you know, saying these things, but it's still not like, you know, I don't think like a big, like general uh, uh, known thing. And I think it should be because, you know, if you just do this, bre these breathing techniques and maybe expose yourself to the cold a little bit, it can have benefits for your yeah. immune system that's good, if not better than um, certain medicines and certain things. And, you know, how is that not healthcare? That, right. I that is 100% healthcare. And that's a big reason that I want to go back to school because, you know, if if people like me aren't trying to pick up the torch and run with it after after all the, the uh, blessings and great mentors and uh, experiences and amazing clients I've had the uh, ability to be around and like fund me and like literally, you know, like, it's like Brett Favre said when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame for football. Like, you couldn't believe he was paid for football. It's really fascinating to me that I'm, I'm paid to help people train because it's so, you know, I'm passionate about it. It's really fulfilling for me. Yeah. Um, if I'm not going to go and, and continue my education and, and try and, like, get these ideas in there, like, I don't know um, who else is. And I hope there's a lot of other people. And I hope I, I get to meet a lot of great people and, and kind of help with this um this kind of thinking like i'm not like you know western medicine and stuff obviously there's a lot of great technology with it but 
like we talked about in the beginning, you know, I really do still think we are in this odd, awkward teenage growth phase with technology. And I do think that includes medicine as well, too. Like, yeah. uh, if you research why um, students, uh, medical students who are doing their, um, um, gosh, what's it called? We're putting in all their other uh, thesis. Not their thesis when they're doing their hours when they're in when they're getting uh, in the yeah like it, uh, yeah whatever the interning word yeah. is like when they're getting that the time is like it's well known like you're gonna be on call and you're gonna go restless for like a long time and uh, 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 I guess a lot of research would indicate that there is a, a medical misdiagnosis problem right mm -hmm. that no one wants to talk about either just right. because people are human and people it, make isn't that like the number one I think it's of I think it's like number two maybe behind heart. I, we would have to fact check that, but it's yeah it's okay. Yeah, there's top. like five hundred thousand heart attacks a year in the United States, not worldwide. It's more yeah. worldwide. Um, and then like misdiagnosis is huge. Yeah, and a lot of uh, there was a guy on the Rogan podcast. I, his name was Steve something. I forget, but he was like a sleep sleep expert guy, and he says something really profound. And he was basically talking about where like. Wh how did this like sleep deprivation, like, um, like just expectation happen in the medical field where you're just expected to go like 30 hours and like, you know, I, maybe right. I could, I could see like wartime, you're a, a, a nurse or a medic and you got to like deal with just people coming with their legs. You know, I could see that. Okay. That's one example, but in like just the general, um, populations like that kind of doesn't make sense and i guess you could trace it back to or and there's a story of the, this uh doctor from oxford who was like staying up and working like these ridiculously long hours and i guess the story is is that he was doing initial research on cocaine and lidocaine and he's like the one that discovered that so he was inevitably <laughs> trying these things out <laughs> and was up for like 25 hours straight for like you know and then longer for years in a row and like set the standard for what a, uh, a right, uh, studious medical scholar should be. And like, I maybe trickle down that effect to the medical field as we know it. Like that's a story that you could read and there's like Hilarious. valid, I guess, proof there, but you know, and probably other things. And of course you want to help people in the nature of the job, you know, probably brings people to work those, those oddities too. But that's a real discussion to have too, you know, like that, we should talk more about, you know, sleep and breathing mm -hmm. to help improve sleep and the technology that could be maybe in hospitals to like, maybe there should be sleep pods for nurses and stuff. So who uh, knows? Yes. sleep. Yes. I think people have been calling for sleep pods for like, like decades now. Nobody wants to install them because they're like, well, everybody's going to go to sleep on me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my, yeah. my employees are just going to sleep. Asleep. Yeah. Well, if they're more productive, you know, then. seriously, like a 20 minute power nap. I mean, if, if you got an employee who is just like smashed tired and they're not even able to like, you know, work at all, like what's the big deal if they go take a 20 minute power nap and then yeah. come back and then they'll, they'll pick right up and they'll be much better. So, especially if that's employees making important decisions, like, you know, if they're an accountant for a multi million dollar company, or if they're like, you know, going to make a decision about doing an evasive procedure or something like right. you know, if they're all they're thinking about is like yawning and wanting to put a pillow over their head when they get home, like they're probably not focused enough to, make a decision on finances or something like you should, I, I as a, uh, hopefully a future employer and, and stuff, that's, those are the things that I would like to think about, um, you know, because I think a more healthy workforce is a more productive workforce and inevitably a more loyal workforce, right? Well, if you ever need somebody to come work for you and you have sleep pods, I'll be the guy. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come right out there and work for you. Oh, there we go. I'll hold you to that. It's like the Forrest Gump, Lieutenant Dan moment right there. Uh, I will work I for sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even oh. pay me. Just like, can I just sleep? Just yeah. Quality sleep. Here you go. Here's a temp. Hey, you're speaking to. You're speaking to a guy who 24 hour shifts. I don't even know what I'm. What kind of sleep I'm going to get. So. Yeah. So how does that work for you? That is a great yeah, question, it, actually. So what do you do to, to deal with that? I know you have your Ango caffeine spray, which sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, that's the problem. You know, you start to rely on things like that, and you don't want to do that. And that was a little bit of a, a, a thing I thought about, too, because I want to – I do want to promote healthy living, and I want to help out firefighters wherever I can. 
um, because they certainly help me. I could, and I have my, this is my way I can help back. I don't want to say, well, just, you know, spray caffeine in your mouth or take, you know, take pre-workouts all the time. Every once in a while, they're okay. And they do help. And um, we're, we're that kind of society. It's, it's a le- caffeine is a legal drug, but you have to be careful with it. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta get rest. You gotta get real rest. And um, it's hard to do when you're on shift work. And that's, that's one of the things I'm working on and tackling, you know, and, and I think that's what I can bring to the table when I, when I coach other shift workers, I get it. I get what kind of situation they're in and especially the younger guys. And I used to do it. I wouldn't sleep much. And then I come off shift and go hit, the, hit the gym, like hard as hell. Like, cause well, I have to, but I mean, your, your cortisol levels are just through the roof and here you are just adding to it, lifting heavy weight, going aggressive, when probably what you should be doing is taking a yoga class or just doing some steel mace work, yeah, you know, to shut, shut it down. And yeah. Yeah. And, little, and yeah. that's where I fell in love with the steel mace. Cause I, I was like, okay, I could still exercise. And then when I'm done, I feel like I'm cause you know, it's like doing a flow is not the same as like, okay, we're going to squat and we're going to go heavy. It's two different mindsets. And yeah, your your adrenals are getting cranked up on one end and on the other end you're actually winding yourself down but you're still breaking a sweat you still feel good and then you you fall asleep the normal time you should instead of being up all night because it's it's that that lag from being up at work yeah and and eating a scoop of pre-workout right after right yeah yeah yeah. and then maybe a coffee and then you're all your body just doesn't know what's it that's a that's a problem so but that's a problem for people going to college like you said uh, people who are studying and it's it's just it's crazy thinking it's crazy to think that we could sidestep something so critical you wouldn't ask somebody who's studying hours and hours not to eat right you know or drink water so why are, why are we sacrificing sleeping and things like that? It's crazy. Well, inevitably, I think some people do like not eat and drink water and stay up and just pound Starbucks or like, you know, <laughs> a, a couple monsters and try and. Or Adderall. Or is better. Yeah, yeah. Adderall. Yeah. Those are another thing. Yeah. When I, again, like breathing and fitness and like, you know, it's just some basic adding like you know swing a mace and then like you know try and throw a colored tennis ball or like those those hico sticks at an athlete or, or someone or yourself and get in you know or play sudoku get your whatever get it, play a brain game get your there's better ways i think than uh i i really think that um you know and i i'm not you know i say they but i'm not like not guilty of it myself at times right but i'm trying to like i think that you know when you're first looking for the biohacks you know, you're looking for the silver bullet at some point. Yeah. Um, and like a lot of people want that silver bullet, you know, the, the, the four minute abs and the, the, mm-hmm. the one pill that's going to make the limitless pill, right? Yeah. P9 or whatever it's called in the movie. And, you know, like Jocko is right, man. I think Dave and Goggins are right. Like you really, there's, you just got to work really, really hard and then try to be really, really smart about that hard work. You know, like if you don't have to work hard, just because you got to work hard that day like you still as long as you got the same amount of work done or more in a week like one day of doing a, like you said you know like uh bringing yourself down by doing some different type of modality workout like it doesn't it doesn't make you like a less of a lifter or whatever like it's just um again i think there's a lot of emotion tied to, to certain things where it's yeah. more objective and like just trying to figure out how am i going to actually get all these goals done and like still have time to like you know have be with my family or my girlfriend and like, yeah be happy see my friends and like be a human yeah yeah um, just so. have like a normal life yeah and that's where i again i that's why i like i love this podcast and i love the the community and i i like sharing information because i really think like it's so important that we impart like this coaching it's like it, i think all trainers are life coaches like i don't think that it's really any different i think we're first responders to a lot of things it's just the, the nature of the, the yeah. business and um yeah, we got to be adaptable and we got to be able to, you know, adapt with people and adapt with stresses and, you know, the sleep stuff. And like we could talk, you know, this could be you know, it's a Steel Mace Nation podcast. Obviously, we love the mace. I love the mace. But, you know, there's a lot of things to think about, you know, even if you are just using the mace for fitness, there's uh, you, you still have to eat. And you still got to sleep and you're still yeah. going to deal with stress. 
like people who are doing other fitness things. So those are things that we got to talk about and figure out and work together and adapt. Yeah. Uh, good point. And thank you for saying that because that's, that's the, the general idea here. Um, what, why I started doing the podcast and, and before you start your school in six months, shoot me a message, man. Remind me, I want you to come back on and let's talk more about this stuff. Absolutely. I want to get you before you get busy and you tell me, you know, I can't, I, then, I it'll be like 10 years from now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have an ebook that I made that I mentioned that breathing ebook. Yes, I, I, yeah. I send it to people for free because breathing, I th it's part of like my way of getting people to understand the basics oh. of stuff and yeah. just even reading it, even to that, like you still got to just reading. It doesn't mean you're, you're doing it right. So it's like, uh, I think it's my way to, to give back and then to get people like to, get interested in why they're working with me or someone at 360 fit or obviously with any fitness trainer that's going to help you get better and breathing is a huge component so and and how do you want people to send away for that to uh, hit you up on instagram if they just hit me up on instagram and you send me your email I'll, I'll send it to you um at some point i'll make it like a downloadable clickable thing um and then you'll find it on my my linkedin tree uh my link tree but uh for now just send me a message uh on any platform and i'll, I'll find a way to get it to you and there's videos in it short videos so it's like a, a nine page like interactive uh ebook all right cool man thank you uh, everybody that's dylan edwards there for you he'll be back on the show again hope you like this podcast make sure you reach out to him and get that uh that ebook and if you're in the area where he lives you're in the uh northern chicago area right north northwest chicago suburbs arlington heights the Plains, mount prospect area yeah all right. Like, so if you're like in that few area. minutes from O'Hare Airport, so in the future, you know, all these travel plans and meeting people and stuff. We yeah, yeah, about. yeah. If 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 you're uh, in the area, hit them up for some training, and and don't be afraid to drive like an hour once a week or something to hook up with a good trainer. It you know, if Dylan's the right guy, he's the right guy. And and what's the big deal? You listen to a cool podcast like this one, and then when you get there, yeah. you train with Dylan, and then you listen to the podcast again on the way home. Hey, me and Christian have a six-hour, uh, seven-hour drive up north to see uh, Mr. Mike and Robbie soon. So I'll, I'll fly out to see anybody. I, it's fun. It's all yep. about the experience. Yep. That's it. I love it, man. Fred, good. thank you, man. This has been a lot of fun. You're an yep. awesome guy. It's awesome podcast. Awesome experience. And, uh, yeah, look forward to, to continuing our our friendship and uh, our, all these, uh, these fun conversations. Yeah, man, you got it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And make sure you subscribe um, to the podcast. All right. Take care, Dylan. We'll and see get you. get a hat. Buy a hat. Yeah. Get, get, it looks <laughs> good on you, man. I should. It looks better than when it's on me. So I think I, I might have that. to get some uh, modeling pictures from you. <laughs> Amen. All right, man. Take care. Hey, you too, Fred. Be well.